Hello and welcome to a Burkamp Wonderland and Arsenal podcast. I'm Gunnar Gimli and tonight I'll be joined by, first up, he's the fat hairy one, it's Danny the GFP. Hello Danny. Am I meant to be here then? Yeah, no, well, no, you're not only in a capacity as in you're recording this and overseeing things. Oh, thank you very much. Well, I'll fuck off now then. Okay, wonderful. So, as you all know, it's international break. So, I have joined with me the ABW bloggers. Um, so, say hello, bloggers. I will go through. We'll start with Jake. Hello, Jake. Hello, sir. How are you? I'm I'm all right. And how the devil is Jake this evening? Ah, oh, Jake is okay. It's a quarter to five in the morning. Commitment. That's what I'm all about. Quarter. You got up to quarter to five for us. Stayed up. Stayed up. Didn't get a nap in. Yeah. Oh, so you're Australian, so you're quite obviously drunk. No, 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 not today. Really? Yeah, yeah, day off. You can tell, you can tell by the shock in my voice. <laughs> should, we, should we move on? Go on. Next up, I'll introduce to you Neil Robbins. Hello, Neil. Good evening, gentlemen. How are we all? Very well, thank you. It's a, it's a pleasure to have you back on the show. Thank you for having me back. It's uh, nice to be with you all. That's quite all right. And next up, we have Drew. Hello, Drew. Hey, how are we? Not too bad at all, thank you. How has your summer been? Um, hot, but hot. good. Yeah, hot uh, and a lot of alcohol. Hot and a lot of alcohol, so it's been good. Def- definitely tell you're not from England. <laughs> no. All, all, it's, all it's done is rain. Um, and finally, joining us, you might remember him from the podcast three or four weeks ago, it's Simon Collins. Hello, Simon. Hi, how are you doing, Kim? I'm not too bad at all. This will be going out on a Thursday. But as I'm aware, there are no scores or anything as yet, are there, Danny? Don't go ask me questions when I'm getting questions from Twitter and I've got myself on mute. I'm not here. Are you eating pie? Wales drew nil-nil. That's all we we care about. Come on, the Welsh. Yucky da. Radio Cymru. Hey. Thank you very much. Third on the left. (laughs) There's no no results or anything. No, No, fantastic. Um, So we'll start off then by talking about basically everything that's gone on since we last spoke to you guys at the end of the season. Um, I want to get a little bit of analysis on how you think the season's gone so far. Um, I want to talk about what you think of the transfer window, um, how you think Arsenal's done. Um, you know, many people say that Arsenal, have, even though we only signed Petr Cech, have had a, a quite a good transfer window, seeing as the, the calibre of our new goalkeeper is fantastic. I also want to talk about the ambition of Arsenal Football Club and what you think classes as success. Um, so there's a few interesting topics there that I'll pull from tonight's show. But we will start off with how you think the season has gone so far. And I'll start that one off by going to Neil. The, the season, I guess, has been kind of rocky uh, form-wise. We've obviously got a couple of decent results now with Newcastle and the Palace game. Um, but I don't think we've seen a fantastic performance. I think the first half at Palace, we looked like we were ready to click into gear. Um, but obviously the performances since then haven't been great. There is a big argument, I think, that I'm sure we'll come on to regards to team selection, who should be in, who shouldn't be in which I think is a huge talking point regarding are we fitting players in to, to fit them in. But it's not a disaster. We're not miles off. Um, but I do think there's there's a massive room for improvement uh, performance-wise. OK, no, that's a, a, a very fair analysis. I will ask all of you boys this question because I think this is a fairly interesting one. Um, Drew, would you like to elaborate on what Neil said or do you think differently? I think on the balance of what we've seen so far, I think this is the best we could probably do. We traditionally we start slow. The fixtures hasn't really been too kind. I mean, it's not been easy if you look at who we've played. Um, even though Newcastle is shit, they're still not that bad at home. We're not firing on all cylinders yet, so I'm not necessarily freaking out at the moment. Um, we we could be better, but it could be far worse. We could be Chelsea at the moment. Um, so it, it I mean, 34 matches left. So there's time to right the ship in any number of ways. Um, I'm sure we'll get into all that kind of stuff later on with you know the other toppers we can get into but i think it's not been the start we've wanted but i think it's it's better than it actually could be given how close our matches actually have been Um, we could have dropped more points than we actually did so not not time to panic just yet no hopefully not um we're in an international break at the moment um and i think that going into it a lot of us actually had higher hopes um 
Simon, I'd like to hear your thoughts on how you think Arsenal have done so far. Yeah, I think as the guys say, it's not um, it's not been the greatest start. But as we've said, you know, usually Arsenal starts the season at a pretty slow pace. But I think if you'd said at the start, you'd be on sort of seven points, you know, around the top four. It's not a terrible place. And other than Manchester City, no one's really looked great. So I don't think there's any, any cause for panic or anything like that. And the res- results will come, I think. I think that, that Stoke game coming up after the the international break will be will be an interesting one. I think if, especially after the window, which I'm sure we'll get to talk about, but I think that result will really be, you know, so crucial. If, if you don't get three points there, you can just see the reaction on Twitter already. You can read the tweets and what they'll be. So no cause for panic. I think it's about par for the course so far. Mm. And Jake, are you calm? Calm, yeah. I'm, I'd say I'm calm. It's... Um... Uh, I concur with everyone else. It hasn't been the best of starts, but it's not like we're in the worst position we've ever been in, and it's not a crisis or anything like that. It's we don't really have anyone from the starting eleven that like that would be picked injured, which is you know, which is good. I think I don't think <laughs> while Jack Wilshire and Danny Welbeck and those boys will be trying for places, I don't think they're automatic first eleven. So. My my thing is, which I said on my blog, was that it's 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 where we are and the points that we have at the moment is all right, considering we haven't performed well. Like, had we have been playing well and have only seven points, you'd worry, you know? Mm. And I think going into this season, it's been a, a very interesting one. It's been the first season for maybe four or five years where the pundits or a segment of the pundits have actually called us to win the title. Um, we were hoping that when we went into the transfer window that Arsenal maybe would build on the squad that they already had. Um, maybe not in terms of actual first team 11, but in, in depth, because I think we can all agree that Arteta and Flamini aren't necessarily in a position where they would be trusted if Coquelin, um maybe got a straight red and had to take a few games out, or even worst case scenario, if he got injured. Um, the question that, again, I will ask to all of you is, have Arsenal's actions in the transfer window changed where you see us finishing this season? Um, and I'll go back to Simon for that. Um, I think when we, 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 uh, we did our predictions, didn't we, sort of, just before the Community Shield or around then. And I think we were all, <clears throat> when we gave our transfer window evaluation, I think we all said that that check was good, but there needed to be more than that. And um, certainly given given how the other teams have, have strengthened in that period of time from you know the start of August, you know, City have gone out and got Otamendi and De Bruyne, Chelsea have got Pedro. Um, I just think it was, it was a good window for Arsenal and it could have been a great window. And I think... I think when I gave my predictions at the start, I said, no, I think they'll, they'll be challenging for the, for the title, but that was on, on the shape of the squads. Now, I think, I think we're just two players short again, which is frustrating because it seems to be often the case. But I think, yeah, it wasn't quite the way the window wanted it to end for, for the fans and for Wenger as well. I mean, there's, there's no doubt he obviously wanted to buy someone and, and we'll get into whether he could have done or not. But yeah, I think the squad's now just a little light, uh, up top and then, uh, defence midfielder role. Mm. And uh, those that watch Transfer Deadline Day on Sky Sports um, would have seen a small piece at the end by Paul Merson um, where he basically accused Arsenal Football Club of, of cheating its fans. Now, Neil, you're someone that goes to every game. You are a season ticket holder. Do you feel cheated in the way Arsenal have conducted their transfer business as a fan? Um, I, I don't feel cheated. I, I think that the window um, is pro- this is probably one of the most difficult windows ever, um, and I, I mean that because of the amount of money that's uh, the new TV money that's being flooded into the Premier League. It's just meant that teams don't actually need to sell players. Um, the fact that we've seen Everton say no to essentially forty million for John Stones and West Brom saying no to. 20 odd million for Berahino just tells you exactly the, the way the market is. Um, you know, rich clubs could usually in the past just come and pick up any player they want from those teams, throw enough money at it, and it, and it will happen. Um, United have, um, you know, as everyone knows, have spent 36 million quid on a, a 19 year old striker. Um, you know, they are more than happy to throw any money at anything. 
I just think it was literally a lack of top quality players available. Mm. You could be right. Um, we, uh, it has been banded down across the Arsenal fan base this summer that one of the main excuses was that there was literally no players in the positions that would strengthen Arsenal. Now, that seems very, very hard to believe from a fan point of view, considering Arsenal Football Club, one of the biggest clubs in the world, has a scouting network that probably stretches the world over. Now, Jake, is it really that hard to believe that there was nobody out there that could strengthen Arsenal Football Club with our scouting network? Of course there's players that could strengthen the club, but it's the positions that we needed filled. And, you know, right off the bat we got checked, so that was a box ticked. But it's, you know, what the positions that everyone else claimed. Now, I think we could have gone and got another, in quotes, defensive midfielder or midfielder in general. But when you look at it, there's still, and I know he's perennially injured, but... When you're talking about who's actually at the club and not being a horrible bastard, there's still Wilshire, there's still Rosicki, Arteta and Flanini. They're still there, whether people like it or not. So had we brought in another player without letting one of them go, it would be just a bit of a, a cluster in midfield or an overstock, whatever you want to call it. But up front, it's you know people saying you needed a world-class striker, 25-goal-a-season guy, blah, blah, blah. It's the team's... It, it's, a, it's a weird period of football at the moment where all the top big-time goal-scoring strikers are currently at massive clubs. Lewandowski's at Bayern. I guess you could say Aguero's at City. And, you know, Benzema, I, I wouldn't say he's a 25-goal-a-season world-class player. I don't think he would do that in England. But um, it's, just, it's just not that simple to get that position at the moment without forking out an obscene amount of money and we know for a fact that our club aren't going to do that or enter a bidding war and it's also people seem to think that it's just so easy you just go and get Benzema it's a if the club want to sell b if the player wants to come (laughs) you know it seems easy when you're getting guys like Ozil and Sanchez one year and the next but I don't know maybe I'm reading too much into it but I think I I think we needed a, a winger more than anything, just because I don't think Ox... If Theo was to be a striker this season, Ox couldn't play on the right every game by himself, and I felt someone like Aubameyang would have been good for us. But, um, yeah, I've rambled on enough there. (laughs) No, um, I I also wanted to uh, talk to you guys about the news that broke shortly after the transfer window. Um, And that news was that Danny Welbeck is going to be out for a large period of time. Now... Um, if you think about it and you think about player rehabilitation and we've seen um, Jack come back from an injury that's not similar but with the same kind of time scale and we've seen hiccups in his recovery. So, I mean, what I want to ask you guys is when do you next think we're going to see Danny Welbeck in an Arsenal shirt? And I'll send that one to Drew. Knowing how things go with us when it comes to injuries, it wouldn't shock if he wasn't back till January or February. Um, something because I think more often than most people, at least we might be biased in a negative aspect when it comes to this, but there's been so many of our players that have been out injured and then they have those constant injury hiccups when they're trying to reach recovery. Um, and then they end up being out another, you know, three weeks, a month. Um, the, and the issue with Wellback now is because we're short. Um, as in a forward, we, we actually really are short out for wide players as well, if you really think about it. Um, I'm worried that he's going to be rushed back into fitness because we're short in multiple areas in the first team. And, and usually when, when you rush someone back to fitness from a long-term injury, especially that involves surgery, it doesn't go well. Um, so, I mean, I know they're quoting around Christmas time, but it wouldn't surprise me if that was more close to the end of January, like another extra month. Um, mm. Thing, the thing for me, though, if, if that was to happen, um, I think no matter what happens, we, we have to go in for somebody in January. But certainly if Welbeck gets a setback, then there would, there would be no excuse if he didn't. Um, I know I'm sure we'll, we'll touch on our, our thoughts about that whole debacle as well. But um, I don't know. I, I just uh, I, I, I do worry. The, um, the lack of business had me, has me worried. Um, 
And uh, like I just said, the fact that we all know how injuries go with this club has me worried that he's going to be out longer than he was quoted. And then, you know, we, we could be screwed in the end, depending on, on how we handle it going forward. Mm. I think you also have to take into the account as well the amount it's, of time it's going to take him to get his full match sharpness back. Um, we've seen players come back from long-term injuries before that haven't necessarily hit the ground running. I mean, there's going to be a fair amount, I would say, possibly one to two months where he's going to be trying to find his form again. Um, but the reason that I touch on that in this particular segment of the podcast is because it's under the, should I say, that the fans believe then that uh, the club knew about his injury uh, before the transfer window closed. Neil, what do you make of this particular situation? Because surely that's suicide, isn't it? To uh, know about Danny Welbeck's injury and know that he's going to be out for such a long period of time and not actually get someone, even if it's not a first-team striker. I I think it's a good point. I mean, it's no real surprise that it wasn't announced prior to the window shutting because if he was going in for players, it would just stick more and more... Uh, on what we'd have to pay for someone. I mean, my, my theory on Welbeck is that when he has played for us, it's been very, very rare that he's actually started down the middle. He's always played to the left-hand side. Um, and when they announced the Champions League squad, of course, the one that was added was, was Jeff. Um, and I know that there's a lot of talk about him. And I just wonder if we're going to see Jeff play down the left-hand side. Um, if he is going to use Theo as that backup striker, maybe he doesn't even consider Welbeck in, in that vein. So it could be that he's thinking, I've lost someone down the left-hand side, and in the meantime, we'll, we'll use Jeff for that. Mm. And Simon, you're someone that is close to the tabloids. I mean, did you get any wicked whispers earlier in the week about uh, Welbeck's injury? No, because it's quite sort of an odd injury with Welbeck. Because if you remember, it was back sort of April time when it first happened and it kept being sort of, oh, he might be back next week, might be back next week. Then he missed the cup final. Then over the summer, obviously, it all went quiet. And then at the start of the season, it got sort of brought up, where's Welbeck? Will he make the international break? And it was described by the club as being um, bone bruising, which Dom would something um, would explain quite well. But basically, it's something that they can flare up very quickly and uh, Wenger was asked, I think, about sort of two weeks ago, you know, does he need surgery? And Wenger said no, and it seemed like a genuine answer. It seemed like that was the case. And I think it's just got to the point with his rehab. I know he wasn't doing any, he wasn't doing any ball work. He was in the gym sort of doing strengthening and stuff. And it got to the point, I think, where it was, you know, they had to have surgery. I think he's having it on the cartilage. But I don't think the fact that he was injured would have dramatically changed. Like Wenger wanted a striker regardless, and I don't think him being injured would have would have changed his thought process in, in bringing someone in. It, it would sort of, obviously I know it's difficult, but you think maybe if we could have recalled Chubrak Pom or not loaned him out in the first case, because it looks like Welbeck will be out till Christmas, and maybe could have kept Akpom there as just another option, and then January to loan out Akpom and you've got Welbeck back. That's the only thing I think perhaps could have been done differently, but... Maybe they decided that it's, it's better for Akpon to go and get the games. Mm, very true. I, I, I want to grasp what the rest of you think of that as well. Um, so next I'll go to Jake. I think Welbeck might. There's a slight chance he could come back earlier. We've seen the magic hands of Shad Forsyth bring Giroud back earlier last season. We, you know, I mean, We're not saying that he's got some kind of healing ability. I don't want all these people freaking out and running to him but it seems that he's he's doing something different that we hadn't had happen before and guys are just coming back to from injury earlier like I recall please uh, correct me if I'm wrong but I, I recall something about Jack Wilshire was going to be out for longer than expected and he's now expected to be back after the international break so let's hope that the that a uh, worst case scenario Danny's out till Christmas but we could have him back sooner which would be good but um what Neil said earlier is exactly what I was going to say. Like, if you go and announce prior to the window closing that that Welbeck's, you know, injured long term, first of all, if they were looking for another striker, every team's going to put an extra five or ten million pounds on that player. And secondly, if you'd been at the Twitter cemetery prior to the window closing, it would have just been worse. So, 
you know, maybe it's a, it seems like a sly move by, by the club had they have known that he was going to be out injured longer, but it's probably was, was the safest bet, really. Mm. And uh, now the transfer window is closed, and it's very much a case of we go with what we've got. Um, I think there's a, a lot of Arsenal fans out there that are just hoping that there's maybe a few that break through, um, or there's a couple of players that are maybe being classed as underperforming that actually step up to the plate. Now, I can think of a few players in our team that have got big, big seasons ahead of them, um, even more so now we fail to strengthen. Drew, can you pinpoint anyone that you would expect to have a big season or that you would hope would, you know, come in and, and be the difference? I think before the season, we, we all spoke about it um, when we were doing our predictions um, for the blog. I think a lot of us have a lot of expectations surrounding Ox. Um, he's, he's fit again. You know, he walked up. Um, there's seemingly the, the right-sided berth is available for him to take if, if he plays into it well enough. Uh, but I think, unfortunately, um, I know Neil might, might agree to an extent, I think the players that can break through are dependent on the football we play. Uh, Ox is never going to break into the first team if our tactics don't allow him to break into the first team. By that I mean, you know, we, we all love Ramsey, whether it's, it's a, whether it's a great deal or a little bit. Um, but Ramsey plays on the right because Ramsey fits the you know possession buildup style. Ox does not. Um, for our, the players that we have that we hope break through, like Ox or the younger players, you know, like, you know, like Jeff or people of that ilk, um, they, they'll only be able to really come into the first team and, and make a difference if they are given the actual opportunities to do so. Um, starting a match or three, four, five matches in the spin doesn't necessarily mean you're given a real chance to succeed. Um, the cards have to fall your way. Um, and, 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 and usually those cards, when it comes to our deck, involve tactics. So if our tactics aren't bringing out the best in our players, whether if it's established first team players or people looking to break in or someone like Ox who finally wants to take his chance, unless he really is given the proper hand dealt to him to come through, it's not going to matter. No. Which, for, which for me is a big concern. Um, I think Wenger does have to sit down and look at the players available to him until January and, and survey and, and see if what we're doing at the club in regards to how we're playing, if it's if it's best for certain players, um, and if it's not, then he has to become you know more tactically flexible. I'm not saying we need to stop playing the, the brand of football we play, but we have to play more than one way. And if we don't, then it's going to isolate players that we need to make a big impact because they won't be having the chance to if you get my drift. And uh, Neil, I want to get your thoughts on this as well. I think the one player who we were really hoping was going to be a huge, huge season for, um, and he obviously got injured straight away, but was Jack. He is the one that does bring something a little bit different to, to what we have anywhere across the pitch, really. It's that drive to midfield. Um, we have really missed that, especially against West Ham. I thought we could have done with somebody driving forward with the ball. Um, you've got Santi, who's use the ball, we'll pass the ball, Aaron will make breaks, but we need someone to really attack attack a uh, back four with, with the ball um, and play into Ozil and, and take the ball back off Ozil. So I think Jack is the one that could could really make a huge difference to, to the way that we play. Um, but we need him back fit. But he's a couple of weeks away um, and should be back on the bench soon. Hopefully so. Um, Simon, is there anyone other than the players mentioned that you'd hope would have a big season? Um, well, I think Czech's the one. I think, you know, obviously it's the only signing, so <laughs> it'd be good if he had a, 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 you know, a strong season. I think Bellerin will have another another great season. I think he's, you know, he's called up to the Spain squad. I mean, for his age, it's absolutely incredible. And I think he's an example of, you know, sometimes the solution is internal. You don't have to go and buy someone. And whether, you know, with I know someone... Felix, obviously, we still haven't seen much of him play. He's so highly regarded by by the club, and um, I know for the under twenty ones he plays at centre back. But that's what Wenger did with with Song as well. And uh, long term, you could see him as a as a holding midfielder. Maybe he could be someone that gets an opportunity at some point. Um, it'd be good to see someone come through the ranks like that. And, and other than that, maybe maybe Jeff might have a bit of 
something to show as well. So I, I think Ben has got some some players up his sleeve that I think will will get the opportunity. But um, yeah, Czech and Czech and Bellerin would be my picks for to have strong seasons and see him in the probably the league's team of the year. I predict. Very good. Um, and Jake, finally with you on this one. Probably taking the really safe and easy route, but uh, I think as soon as he. I don't know. I don't know if he recovers because he just doesn't seem to ever stop. I think once Sanchez really gets going, he's he's going to be big for us because um, I don't think second season syndrome is going to be anything that's going to stop him. He's he's a wonderful human being. <laughs> um, other than that, I think if there's ample opportunity, which um, sadly, truthfully and sadly, I don't think there will be. I think Gabriel could be a could be a big addition to the team, playing alongside either. Uh, Mertesacker or Kassioni but uh, like I said the sad part of it is if Mertesacker and Kassioni are both fit they play and that's I'm, I'm fine with that like I, I like Gabriel and I think he's got a bright future for us but I just don't see I don't think he's going to replace one of those two but should the opportunity arise when one of them aren't playing I think we've got a good player there other than that I had some pretty big hopes for the Ox as well but it's like uh we don't seem to know what's going on there with the whole Ramsey's playing on the right thing. So uh, I don't know. It just depends if he sees the game time or the formation that we're playing. That's all for me. <laughs> That's quite all right. Um, we should talk about the great man himself as well, or great depending on which side of the fence uh, you want to be on, whether you're AKB or or your Wob. Um, to start, what would you class your guy yourself as guys? Uh, Drew, are you AKB or Wob? I'm an Arsenal supporter. I'm neither. I don't think um, I have immense um, respect for Wenger, but <clears throat> he's also, as, as Chris likes to say, he's not above criticism. But I think that comes as a responsibility as a supporter of a football club. It doesn't mean that you don't support the team, you know, every day that you, that you are a supporter of them, but. If you, as a supporter, think that some things are getting wrong, you can voice your opinion in the negative, and then when you're happy about certain things, you can be positive about it. I don't think it's about picking a side. I, I, I think that's, at that point, that's not supporting a football club. That's more, to me, that's more of supporting an agenda, and the two are very different. I feel that Wenger has, I mean, I would have liked to see more business. I think a lot of us would have. I think he definitely did miss a chance to actually really strengthen us. So in that sense, I'm disappointed. However... Um, it's admirable to me that he is putting such faith in the, the quality we do have. Uh, a lot of people want him to strengthen, and I can agree, but people also forget that we do actually have plenty of quality. We were the informed team in the second half of last season, so it's not like the, the boys aren't capable. Um, I think all our concerns is that it's a long season domestically, plus you have to count Europe, plus the Cups. You know, so all that does come to play and injuries happen. And I think that's where everyone's concerned are lying right now. And I think that's completely justified. But I don't, it, it, and obviously I'm not frustrated at you, but when I get into discussions with other, you know, supporters of the club and, you know, if I say a certain thing, they're like, oh, well, you know, you're an AKB. If I say a certain other thing, they say, oh, well, you're winning ground. Like, no, I'm not. Like, just because I'm either voicing admiration or criticism doesn't make me either one. You can do both and be neither. And, that's what I would classify myself as. I don't think you have to necessarily pick a side. I don't think it's, you know, it's not like an election where you have to pick, you know, one candidate or another. I just think you're you're allowed to see both angles of a point. And I think that's normal. Um, and that's part of debating. It's part of supporting. And I guess it's part of also being as informed as you allow yourself to be. I, I think it's an interesting debate. Um, I think if you go onto Twitter, you can see a, a wide range of views from various different people. I know from... From doing the podcast, there's many different beliefs as to whether you think Arsene Wenger is doing a good job or, or whether you think Arsene Wenger isn't necessarily doing a great job. Um, I think the one thing we can agree on is the end goal is the same for all of us, that we want to see a successful Arsenal football club and a football club that you know can maintain trophy-winning seasons year on year. Um, I want to gauge the the thoughts of the rest of you on whether you're AKB or, or a WOB um, and whether you think Arsene Wenger is succeeding in his job or whether you think he's underachieving. Um, Jake, I'll go to you next and 
you've heard what I've had to say. Uh, do you think that he's underachieving, overachieving? Are you Wob or AKB? I am more AKB. Uh, I'd say I'm very far away from being a Wob. <laughs> very far away from that. I think the man's brilliant, but let me just try and make myself clear. I was an Arsenal fan before Arsene Wenger, and I'll be an Arsenal fan long after he's gone. But um, for what he's done for the club, you know, I pray at his altar just a little bit for for what he's done for us. But right now, I'd say is there's no way he's overachieving because overachieving was the Invincibles, and that's going to be pretty hard to top, you know. But it's not like we're underachieving; where we're unfortunately stuck in limbo a bit, I think. And obviously, we can achieve more and we could win things a bit more frequently or other trophies i wouldn't turn down a third fa cup don't get me wrong i'm gonna be sad to see him go and i love the man don't get me wrong i'm kind of stumped by this (laughs) sorry (laughs) no it's Um, fair enough i mean it's something that that brings out your deepest darkest emotions i mean some people um have supported arsenal because of arsene wenger and and what he's done to the club um, we all know where we were when he took over. And there's many, many people out there that will be listening to this that supported before and can remember the days when Arsenal were really quite poor, um, to put it mildly. And, you know, where we are today, we've had great success over the years. Um, but really to think that we went nine odd years without a trophy, some can say that that's us failing, surely. Can I just so, make one last statement, sorry? <laughs> yeah, go on, Jake. I've heard people, uh, this is probably me trying to make myself quotable, but I've heard people say that Arsene Wenger brought us into the 21st century, and as much as I, uh, as a football club, as much as I, I do love him and agree with that statement that he has brought us into the 21st century, it kind of seems like he's leaving us stagnant there as well, while the Manchester cities and Chelsea's are just never it just seems like they're never going to be out of the top two or three of those two teams it feels like it's a scary thought to think and maybe I'm being massively pessimistic but it just feels like it could turn into a the Liga situation where they're just going to be the dominant two because they've got unending money streams no it's a it's a very fair point to make um Simon your thoughts on everything that you've heard um, AKB, Wob, you know, whether you think he's underachieving or overachieving? Uh, I, th- I think he's doing about, you know, even for where he should be. If you look at our wage bill, you know, it's, it's fourth in the league. Um, as we've said, you know, with, with City and Chelsea, you know, Arsenal can't compete with, you know, that sort of money. And same with Man United as well. You know, look at Man United and someone like Luke Shaw's on, you know, £150,000 a week. You know, the thought of Arsenal paying a left back, you know, that amount of money is just in, insane. It's not the level that Arsenal at. So in terms of of what he's of what he's doing, I think he's he's you know he's doing his job. He's not overachieving. He's, he's not underachieving. He's about he's about where we should be. Um, and in terms of whether he's the right man for the job, I would I would definitely say so. I think you know his, his record proves that. Um, you look at the time from you know the stadium transition and, and when there was that big fallout with with David Dean, it was over the fact that. You know, he said it's it's not possible for us to you know build this stadium and and you know, still compete. The club will fall apart. You know, we need to invest in the players and and credit to Wenger. If you look at, you know, I think back, you know, the transfer window's gone by. I know I'm only about this, but you think back, sort of, you know, six years ago, and we're buying the likes of Park Chu Young and things like that. And you think how far the club's come. Then um, I think he's got every right to have a crack at it with 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 the money now available. So. Um, yeah, I, I would. I'm, I'm firmly in the Wenger camp, but like with the other guys, you know, it's, it's the club you support, not the manager. But um, while he's in the job, he'll have my backing for sure. Yeah. No, that's that's fair enough. We've pretty much heard from all of you regarding Neil. Um, Neil, we'll get your thoughts on that now. I'm a, I'm a Wenger in man, big time. Okay, um, so what I mean, what makes you question? whether he's taking this club forward. I mean, what classes as ambition for you uh, uh, under the manager and what would maybe make you go, OK, he's, maybe it is time to go? How far down the line? Well, I, I always think, look, the, the, the obvious question to ask people who say well, he's, he's, you know, he's stagnant, we, we need something new, is who do we think could do a better job? That That's always the question I love to ask people because people love to shout Klopp, people sh- love to... Sh- to say, oh, if Mourinho is here, he would have done this and that. He, he wouldn't. 
he's had his hands tied for years. And as Simon said, he, he's got to be allowed now to build his own side. He's done amazing things. I mean, when we put the plans together to build this stadium, there wasn't an Abramovich. There wasn't a shake at Manchester City. If they hadn't have come along, we would be in a hugely advantageous position. But 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 it's changed, um, of course. Um, can you really compete with Manchester City and Chelsea? I, I don't know. Manchester United are trying to throw as much money at things as possible, and they still can't do it. Um, so I think he's doing a fantastic job. And I think, uh, and I know you, you had um, Crossy on talking about his book this week. I think when you guys actually get to to read it when it's released, there's some very, very interesting statistics um, money-wise about just how close things came with having our hands tied, which everybody will be really shocked about. And I, and I think a lot of people will change their perceptions of um, Arsene um, and will be amazed at the job he's done because lots of other great managers who are build their careers over spending money. You know, this guy has unearthed some incredible talents. He has kept a side in the top four whilst having to play some really non-top quality players. So I I am firmly a, a Wenger in man. No, that that's fair enough. Um, again, I think I wanted to uh, elaborate on the question that I originally asked you, um, which was, you know, what classes a success if we this season finish second in the league, but we don't win a trophy with the FA Cup, um, does that still class as progression, Drew? I think giving the spending of our rivals and not just our rivals, but how much money is in the league now and, and how well smaller teams have done, like, you know, like the Swansea's and, and even Southampton and those kind of teams to an extent, I think we would have finished second and didn't win uh, the FA Cup. Um, I still would think that. It wouldn't necessarily be a huge jump of progression, but it, it certainly wouldn't be a regression, would it? You know, right now, City of the Informed Team starting out, you know, you have to expect Chelsea to right the ship. United have problems, but they've still started more with more points in the table than we have. Um, the league is harder now, given how much money is involved, how much quality is at the lower teams. Um, I think second place in a league like this, where we only brought in the goalkeeper and didn't really strengthen the first team, I think that that alone by itself should be qualified as a success. Um, it would suck for, uh, you know, not another league, not win the league, you know, it's going to upset a lot of people, but um, the fact is uh, it's, it's tough right now. Um, like, uh, like you guys have been saying, um, there are a lot of concerns with a lot of different people that I've, that I've spoken to off of, you know, out of this group and whatnot, that because of so much money with the three teams, you know, the two city clubs and Chelsea, um, that this is running a risk of becoming like more like a La Liga situation. Um, and it's going to be tough for us to, to really compete um, if, if we don't almost sort of mold with the times, if you will. Not that I necessarily want it to happen, but um, that's another discussion for another time. But I think second place and no trophy, I would consider that progression in an extent where we didn't regress. Um, not a bad season, but not the season we're all hoping for, but I'll gladly take it. Um, I'll ask that to one more of you um, before I move on with another question. Um, so, who shall I give that one to? Um, Neil. Neil? I'll jump in, Gim, quickly. I was, I was just going to say, this it sounds quite weird, and it's going to probably come out as the bizarrest point possible, but personally, I'm not overly, it's going to sound really weird, but not overly fussed about winning trophies, just from the viewpoint of that, what I would deem as success is the team playing, I know it will come hand in hand with it, but the team playing well, playing attractive football and playing, you know, in a good style. The number of teams that win trophies in terms of percentage is, you know, sort of a finite number, sort of two, three percent that wins trophies. As long as the team plays well, plays attractive football, then I'm personally not overly fussed about winning trophies. I know that sounds bizarre, but I would rather the way the team play the way they do than, you know, watch a Mourinho team play every week as Arsenal and win the league, so... That's my no, viewpoint. No, that's, 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 I mean, that's a perfectly fair viewpoint. I mean, everyone's different. And I know from doing a podcast more than most that, you know, uh, our opinions are, are very, very wide spread when it comes to Arsenal Football Club. Um, Neil, I know you're back with us now, so I will ask you that same question. Uh, is a second place finish in the league, but with no trophy to show an improvement on last season? I think it would be. Um, I think you are always 
kind of judged over a 38-game period. Um, I'm not saying that winning a cup isn't a huge achievement, and obviously winning back-to-back cups is a massive achievement, but you finish in the league where you deserve to finish. And I think if we could manage to overturn one of City or Chelsea, I think it would be huge strides. Um, and I agree with Simon. Um, you know, coming from someone who, who does pay for a season ticket, I, I couldn't go and watch Chelsea every week. Um, you do want to be entertained, yes, and winning is important, but you, the, the, the mixture is really vital. And I do think we have that. And I do think we're moving in the right direction. Um, and I do think this squad is certainly capable of a challenge. Will it win it? I don't know, but I think it's good enough to go close. Okay. Um, Jake, you'd like to finish us off? Oh, my turn, is it? Okay. Oh, I wanted to answer your the, your question with a question. I suppose any of the guys can answer this too. Would anyone see finishing third and no FA Cup or no trophy as a, 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 a step backwards? Or the same could be said if we finished third and won the Capital One Cup, would anyone see that as a backward step again? Because we didn't win the trophy that was uh, that's considered a level higher. That, that's what I just wanted to say. Like, you know, is it? Yeah. I was going to say, I wouldn't say necessarily the difference between the FA Cup and Capital One Cup. I mean, surely a trophy is a trophy. Players like Mesut Ozil, um, Alexis Sanchez come to Arsenal to win trophies. And I don't think there, there's going to be too much emphasis on whether that's FA Cup or Capital One Cup. Um, you can't say they come to Arsenal to win trophies. They've won the Emirates Cup this season. Fantastic. Because that's bullshit. And we all know that. Um, however, you know, I, I, personally, if we finished third and won the Capital One Cup, I would be just as happy as finishing third and winning the FA Cup. Now, is there anyone that agrees with that, or is there anyone that thinks that I'm talking complete crap? I totally agree with you. I think the players need to have a consistency of winning trophies. Um, success breeds success, and whether it's the Capital One Cup or the FA Cup, as you say, I don't think it's vitally important. What I do think is important is in Europe, as they go a step further again, we've got to start making the quarterfinals and semifinals. Um, we've got some big players like Alexis, like Ozil, who expect to be playing in those types of games. And I think it's really time that we we move along again because we we are consistently being known as the club that goes out the first round as soon as the group stages are finished. So I, I think that's another area where... We need to massively improve. No, I, I would agree with you, Neil. Um, is there anyone that wants to build on that? Anyone that thinks that the Capital One Cup is is not as good, or wouldn't be as happy with the Capital One Cup as they would an FA Cup? I think it's a good. I think it's a good trophy to win in terms of you know the momentum it builds. You can get it in the bag quite early March time. I, I don't know why Wenger doesn't take it that seriously. I know he doesn't particularly particularly like it and does use it for the unks and stuff, but he's never won it and. The club obviously hadn't won it for for a fair amount of time, and I think it's 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 a trophy, like you say. And I don't think when the league's so difficult to win, the Champions League likewise is. You might as well, you know, try and get a, tr- a trophy in the cabinet by by doing it. So no, I would have no qualms about Wenger taking it seriously this year. I know in years gone by we've complained him not. So you know, if he wants to have a crack at it and you get a good draw, then why not? No, very true. Um, but then there's the other side of the coin with. A lot of our fans, and to quote unquote, um, fourth place is, is not a trophy. What is it inconceivable to now finish out of the top four? I mean, if we didn't make a Champions League spot, whose fault would that be down to? Is that Arsene Wenger, Drew? Yeah, but I, I don't think it would come down to it would be his fault because of the spending. Um, I mean, I, I rant about this stuff all the time, and I know you guys are probably even borderline sick of me talking about it, but I feel like our, our biggest weakness isn't the fact that we haven't spent. It's, it's the fact that we, we don't change the way we play. Um, and our recent results going back from, you know, last year to now kind of show that teams are ready to, to, to play a certain way just to get results off of us. And I think if, if we do stumble out of the top four ever, I think that's going to be the reason. Um, I think even without spending, this team is strong enough to absolutely finish top three. I know United have spent an astronomical amount of money. I, I do think they, they got a few of their signings spot on, but most of them, I feel like they, they, they're a bit of a gamble. Um, so they have a lot of stuff to work out, and Van Hall isn't exactly the 
the greatest manager when it comes to first team stability. So I don't really rate United at the moment. But if you asked me, um, you know, if, if, if we finished third, I'd be happy. But if, if we finished fifth or sixth, um, I don't know if we necessarily have to sack Wenger, but I would be disappointed because it would only be our doing. But it would have to do with our lack of business. Um, if, I mean, if you look at the results like last season, you know, like that Swansea result, um, you know, the Sundown result, um, you know, the West Ham result from this season, matches like that, if we struggle in those types of matches, those are going to be the matches where we end up losing ground um, against the teams around us because, you know, City and Chelsea, you know, they have the ability to go there and still, like, rubber stamp those results in their favor. Consistently, we really don't. Even when United struggle, even United always somehow find a way to win, traditionally. Um, but then you have to ask yourself, if there's any other team that's going to peg us for a top four finish, who's it going to be? And if they were good enough to do it, were they good enough to do it? Or were we bad enough to allow them to? I think if you look at it in those terms, then you could give yourself the answer on your own. Uh, but I know Simon just put it in the chat box. If we finish outside of top four, do we sack him? Um, I would say uh, a gut reaction would say no, simply because I have no idea who would replace him. No, like, I, I, we're, yeah, we're we're a club where we we thrive on continuity and stability, and, and like we can't have someone like Pep come in for two years and then just fuck off to another club again. You know what I mean? Like we would have to have someone who's going to be here for another decade. Like that's that's what this club is built on, like the family atmosphere, the you know that kind of environment. So I feel like a lot of the reasons why Wenger's gotten a free pass almost for for what's been going on for for some people for at least for the last however many years is because I think. A lot of the board might just be asking themselves that same question: Well, who are we going to replace Wenger with when he goes? Um, and I think a lot of, of the fans, once they really understand that, then they might not be so harsh to say, "We didn't sign anyone in, in the summer window. Wenger out." Like, you know what I mean? So. Yeah. No. Very true. I mean, you're having a bit of a discussion in the chat box down the outside. Um, and, and Simon, I, I want to reiterate on a point that you've made. If he doesn't make top four, do you think? Um, he's in a position where he then becomes sackable. Do you think, you know, I mean, we're lucky to the point now that with whatever hand he's dealt, regardless of what money he spent, and I won't talk about net spend. Um, I mean, how, you know, where, where do you get to the point that he becomes sackable? I mean, if he finishes outside the top four, it, it will be... You'd have to think it'd be it'd be discussed. I certainly think with fans and stuff, it would create a big, big shift because financially for the club, you know, it's it's, it's a big difference not having that Champions League money. Um, it's always what he sort of prided himself on, and you know, he's hung his hat on the fact that you know he's consistently made that that top four. And if he went, you know, it would have to be a, you know a serious question. I think he would question it himself. I really get the feeling. I think that if 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 he suddenly dropped off like that, and you know the team was, I think he wouldn't. He would, you know, think about his own position. I think I don't think the club would personally sack him. I think that they'll they're pretty much going to give him license to you know walk away when he wants, barring any sort of absolute disaster. And finishing outside the top four would would be a setback, but it's not a, a disaster. Um, and like the guys say, replacing him would be would be so difficult. Um, I mean, you look around, people like Guardiola, Klopp, and Fans will will instantly call for one of them, but I don't think he would be sacked if 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 he did finish outside the top four. But I think it would be, it would be a decisive decisive summer certainly from the fans' viewpoint, and I think it would be as close as he's ever been to being sacked. No, that's very true. Is there anyone that would like to uh, follow on from Simon? I'll have a just a, a short crack. First of all, I don't think this year there's going to be any change to the top four. I'm glad this isn't. Firstly, uh, I'm glad this isn't a Premier League communal podcast because I know there's going to be Liverpool fans ready to rip my head off. But yes, they've made some signings. I'm not going to go and say that they're excellent signings, but I don't think that they're going to make the top four. Like they're banking their hopes on Benteke firing them into the top four. Well, go for gold, mate. But I mean, other than they'd probably finish fifth, and maybe they'll finish a close fifth to fourth. But other than them. What Tottenham? They, the way it goes with them, their circle of life is they're going to sack their manager in the next 
12 to 15 games and bring in another heroic English manager who's going to rebuild the team confidence and all that crap again. And Everton, I don't know. Who knows where they're going to finish? So first, first and foremost, I don't think we've got a concern this season about dropping out the top four. But for argument's sake, if it were to happen, I just personally don't think that Kroenke would, would sack Wenger, although the pressure on the club from the fans would probably make Wenger have to come out and just pull the pin himself. I think that after 20 years of service, I think he has the right to call it a day on his own terms. And like I said before, I was an Arsenal fan before Wenger and I will be long after he's gone. But I I have to say that if they sacked him because we didn't finish fourth, you know, uh, under reasonable circumstances, let's say we finished fifth or sixth or something, if they sacked him for that, I, I, I'd, I'd be disgusted. I really would. But that's that's just my personal opinion. No, very good. Um, right then, I will move on then. And next, we're going to go to some Twitter questions. Um, we put out on Twitter earlier that we were going to be doing a podcast. And of course, it is Sunday. This probably won't be going out until early in the week, maybe midweek time. Um, but we've got some questions for you. Uh, Danny, you've picked out the best. I was eating licorice, you shitbag. Oh, no, he's always eating. <laughs> I'm starving. I've had to eat all the cherries. Oh, you really right. are a pig. Thank you very much. Oink, oink. You're bullying me again. I'm not. I'm going to be on to Esther Ranson and the That's Life TV. You're going down, boy. <laughs> Hashtag straight out of Cambridge. <laughs> Woof. <laughs> right. This one is from Luca Kolokosic, who is at dream underscore shake. All go and give him a follow. He's uh, one of our... Two favourite Croatian listeners. One for Drew. Do you think Arsene Wenger and negotiations are sometimes a bit too stingy about the transfer fees? I think in a way, yes, because I think Wenger's trying to resist the fact that clubs will always overvalue a player because if they feel like they have to sell a player, they may as well get you know 10 to 15 more than what he's actually worth. Um, I mean, I understand why clubs do it, but I think Wenger just won't be bullied when it comes to, you know... For example, he he never would have spent the amount of money United would have just spent on Martial. I mean, he would have known that he's not worth more than twenty million. And he just won't spend more than twenty million because just because you have the money available doesn't mean you have to you know it doesn't have to be highway robbery by the other club to take all your money. You know what I mean? So I think he does. He is a little bit stingy. Um, sorry, Jake, I can't mute Max. That's what happens. No, I, yeah, I just uh, I, I just feel like he he's not so willingly to just say just because I'm I'm. We're not cash poor. It doesn't mean we have to spend all the cash we have. Um, and sometimes it does frustrate me because I do feel like there have been players in the past where we had very realistic chances of getting, but it just wouldn't stump up that extra five million. Like literally sometimes it's been, you know, a club value someone at 25 million. He doesn't want to pay more than five, 20 million. At that point, five million pounds is not that much of a difference. You could stump that up. But if it's a legitimate amount of money, you know, 15, 20 million over what he feels like they're worth or what he, he's gathered from what the scouts have told him and, and performances of that player. If he feels like that player is being very overvalued, he just won't pay it. He just won't pay it. So I can see his standpoint, but I can also understand the criticism. So sometimes you just have to pay. If it's so negligible of a price, just up and do it. You know what I mean? Uh, okay, yeah. Is someone strangling your dog? Because he doesn't sound like he also just kicked him in the balls. No, they're fighting with other dogs. So. Oh, nice. In the Bronx. Welcome to America. Yeah. <laughs> we hear gunfire or anything, just try and mute yourself. Jesus. <laughs> right, what I'll do, as there's 13 questions, I'll give the question to each of you, one at a time, and then one question each, and then all of you get one, you can go, me, me, if you really want to answer a question as well, because then we can get them all done. Is that all right? So think carefully before sh- shouting your me, me card. Um, this one, I'll, I'll go to, um, are we calling him Chimp, or are we calling him Neil? I'm never sure which one he wants to be called. I don't say asking him, Neil, is it Chimp or Neil, Neil Chimp? Uh, I answer to both, which is not ah, important thing. Fair enough. Right, this one to Chimp, because of your um, close connections to the, our lovely club and the olden days, because, uh, like me, he used to go. Um, actually, so did Simon. Oh, I feel guilty now. OK, this is from Graham J. Hawk. says, Without David Dean at the club, do you think there is anyone else that actually challenges any of Arsenal's decisions? If yes, do you think that's why we haven't challenged for a title race for a long time? Oh, God, that's a loaded question, isn't it? Um, <laughs> Slightly. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, y- yes and no. L- listen, David Dean was Arsenal's right man. We know that. He used to... 
be given a list and he would go and get a deal done. So Wenger could essentially worry about the team and he knew that whoever he wanted was going to come in. Um, I think, unfortunately, that the time where David Dean has left and the time building the stadium has just come into such close proximity, we were never going to really be able to challenge for the title within those years. Um, I guess the next few years will be the real answer to that question because if we do challenge, we will know that it was down to the stadium and not down to David Dean. Was that it? That, that, the answer was shorter than the question. I thought you were going to get a bit more well, shouty. I know I don't want to get shouty because, well, also it's always very nice to be nice to the listener. But hmm. um, I, I don't think David Dean was behind our title pushes. David Dean made sure Wenger had the correct players, but the market has changed so much that I'm not convinced that just if we had had David Dean at the club this summer, we were going to suddenly put out a shiny Benzema or Cavani come this the start of the season. I just don't think the market's in that place right now. Um, you know, I was mentioning before we started tonight that when you've got clubs like Everton turning down £40 million for a player because of the new TV money, it just means that the market's going to slow down. I suspect in January it will be a really busy market. Um, but when Chelsea aren't getting players who they're going for, and when Manchester United aren't getting players they're going in for, I think that sh- it shows that, that, you know, unless you were going to hugely, hugely overspend, like Manchester City did, paying £49 million for Raheem Sterling, you know, it, it could be whoever you want in charge of transfers and it would make no difference. So I suspect we will see, over, as I said, over the next couple of years, if that title charge is because of the stadium build, because he's now free to buy more freely who he wants. He can't buy everybody he wants, but he's certainly in a, in a in a better position to. So do you think David, and I don't personally think David Dean will ever come back, do you? I don't think he's ever going to come back under the Gronky re- regime, no. Um, Even though he brought Gronky in? Yeah, but he took sides with us enough, didn't he? Yeah, he took and that was, that's told the to come mistake. out and find people and he mentioned he'd put them both, didn't he? Yeah, which is... <laughs> what a great man. Um, I think I, th- I think the club would be in a better place if David Dean was there because it would just take away a huge pressure from from Wenger himself. Um, he now, has, as we all know, pretty much does everything with a little bit of dick on the side. But David Dean, will, you know, he got things done for Wenger. So, you know, essentially we would no doubt be in a better place. Would we have titles in the, in the cabinet? I don't think so. Okay, right, this next question I'm going to give to Jake, because he, he he's, uh, likes a bit of an argument. Our very own John Welsh, at jwelsh84, uh, J. go give him a follow, if nothing but to annoy him, says, uh, do you think Merson is right that the fans are being cheated? Are fans right to expect more? Because you're a little bit feisty, Jake, so call Merson a twat if you need. Oh, or Merson not. is a twat, but when, <laughs> when is this assumption that I'm feisty and all this come from? Usually when you're drunk at 6am. Oh well, fucking hell, man! <laughs> Come on, that's uh, that's uh, okay. I, 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 I admit I'm, I call a spade a spade. So yeah, okay, I'll take that. Um, what did Merson say now? It's something stupid again. Fans feeling yeah, cheated. Been, yeah, they've been cheated with the amount of money uh, the club's got. But no, basically, Paul Merson said that if it was Accrington Stanley, the equivalent of what Arsenal spent oh, in the transfer quid. window would be Accrington Stanley spending a hundred quid. He said that for the amount the fans pay in season ticket prices um, that he feels that they're right to feel they've they've been cheated basically um, I think that's pretty much in a nutshell what he what he said if I could be technical about it I mean London is the most expensive city in the world to live so maybe if Arsenal were somewhere in the West Midlands and the ticket prices weren't so expensive then they wouldn't have that debate but then there's no point in me saying that because they're not um I don't know if cheat is the right word, man. It seems to me Paul Merson and who's the other fucker? The bald one that used to play for us, works for ESPN now. What's his name? I've got no idea. What position did he play? Stuart Robson. Oh, that, Stuart Robson. Oh, oh, that like, odious bellend. <laughs> that, he, oh my, if you listen to him, he is like, if he was allowed to, he would just straight up say, Arsenal Football Club are a pack of wankers and Arsene Wenger's a C-U-N-T. He would just say it on live air, no hesitation. I don't know what it is with him and Merson. They just, I don't know, they rub me the wrong way. So I don't really, really take it, anything they say too serious. And I don't want to, 
I don't want to deny John his question. Sorry, Welshie. I don't know. Uh, cheated? I don't know. I would. I wouldn't go that far. But like, it, it all retains back to the Welbeck thing. The club could have told the fans earlier had they have known. And then you know, but then it's the whole well. Oh well, we definitely have to buy someone now. And had they have not, then it just it just kicks up more shit. So yeah, I don't know. We Is should somebody eating sweeties. No, um, yes, you are. We should say um, you are. I can hear you smiling. <laughs> uh, uh, we, sh- we should say it was John's birthday yesterday. Happy um, birthday, John! So from all of us oh, at ABW, birthday, we'd love to wish him uh, a, a very happy birthday. I think he was thirty-one or thirty-two. Okay, so uh, nice. go give him a follow. That's at J Welsh. It was eighty-four. Eighty-four. Eighty-four at J Welsh. That means 84. he's thirty-one, Gim. Well done. Yeah. So. Um, Yes, go give him so a the follow. Only, and, the uh, only, what? So the only problem with that is we have a regular thing where we just come in and go, Happy birthday, Gim Lee! And everyone goes, It's his birthday! We do that all the time. So I did that yesterday for three people, not knowing it was actually John's birthday. Yep, <laughs> but our very own Raj, it's the 18th of September, his birthday, because it says it in his, bar, in his Twitter at all, he was born in 1809, one or the other. Okay. Um, <laughs> but so, yeah, go, go give John a follow. Yes. Uh, proceed with your questions. Thank you very much. It's on to Simon from Warren Moody, who is at Y A S T E E L one eight. That makes no sense at all. Just stop it. Um, <laughs> is it time to drop Cathola and put the Ox on the right wing with Ramsey in midfield? Ozil will still dictate tempo. Uh, well, I think this is something that we talk about talk about a lot. I know um, us bloggers, and it's and it's and it's a painful thing seeing Ramsey out out on the right. Um, just has to play in the middle personally. And I'm of the opinion that with, with Kazora as well, the same, he has to play in the middle and you need to play an out and out winger on the right, be either the Ox or Theo. And so for me personally, I would, I would play one of Ramsey or Kazola depending on, depending on the opposition. So, you know, depending on the match situation, the tactics and stuff. But I think, I think personally in the team, my preference would, would be playing either Ramsey or Kazola alongside, um, Coquelin. So, yeah, maybe it is. It just depends on the game. I think I, I, I'm just not a fan of of Ramsey out on the right, Orcas all out on the right. I just think when you're trying to break teams down, you know, you need width and um, neither of those guys like to stay out there. They like to cut in. Um, so yeah, I think you play one of Kazal or Ramsey, and you leave Özil in that hole. Jolly good. Okay, um, me and Mister Mister Welsh Justice were actually saying. You can maybe want to shoot as if you want that we should move Urzel because Urzel doesn't score goals. Move Urzel next to um, uh, Mad Frankie in the centre of midfield and play Ramsey in the attacking uh, the attacking uh, the, the Burkham hole because Ramsey, if he can score 16 in the season, if he played there, he'd get a load more goals than than Urzel would, and Urzel could still maybe do the same kind of job for midfield. Mm, I, I think with Urzel, he's, he's much better further forward. I think deeper, you'd lose you'd lose what you get from him in terms of assists and, and creativity and the spaces he makes from his runs and his movement. I think he needs to be in that in that number 10 role. I agree with me. I think Ramsey would be great in that off the striker. I think, you know, his, his ability to get in the box is a great finisher. He's an intelligent player. And, that, and that's the thing with Arsenal. Everyone wants to play in that number 10 role. Because all would probably quite like to play there. I know Jack Wilshire wants to play there. And the Ox as well, you know, probably all want to play there. But only one of them can. And I think it, it, it should be Ozil and, and then Ramsey deeper. Okay, lovely. Um, the next question, we will... Um, no, 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 you're not getting out of it. I'll just, I'll just write in that chat box. Are you not putting so much shit in there? I can't read the questions and read all you're that. Not, did you, not, did you, you not want to come in on this, Drew? You're not escaping this time, Denny. For, um, oh. as, here comes the Mesut defence. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, love me, I love Mesut. No, I know you do. Oh, um, good. Uh, first of all, I, we all love Jace, but I think his bias for all things Welsh, maybe <laughs> oh, yeah. like yours, maybe German. Just a bit. There, there, there's no. If, if you say you shouldn't be playing Ramsey in the right, you shouldn't be playing Ramsey behind the striker either. Think of this way: the, the way Ramsey's engine works, if you play him as a number ten, he won't be up there in the number ten role half the time because he can be tracked back on defense. Right? That's the type of player he is. And I know Neil talks about that a lot about Ramsey as the best engine in the side. So why? It's negated on the right. Why would you negate it when he's playing further forward? That that's not. Again, you use your players in a way that brings out their best qualities. Ramsey has to be in the middle next to Coughlin, or has to be Gazola. It's, it's one or the other. Um, 
And I feel like you can still get goals from Ramsey because he does still make those late runs into the area. Yaya Torre scored however many goals two seasons ago for Man City while playing in center midfield. It's because he made those late runs forward. And once he got into the you know, 20 to 25 yard range, he would have a crack at goal. And Ramsey does like to shoot from distance. It's not that he doesn't. And he has a little bit of an eye for goal. So you, you play him there, but you have to, you have to change your instructions to the players. If you tell Ramsey, if you're open, shoot, he'll do it. And you know, how many brilliant goals have we seen from Ramsey from outside the box? The Galatasaray hit last season, that, that one goal versus Portsmouth a couple seasons ago. Like there, there's plenty of examples to show you that he can score goals without having to play for the forward to do it. And if you move Ozil back into center midfield, you may as well not play him at all. Why do you have one of the best number 10s in the world only to continuously play him in the positions where he's not best suited? That's Then that's a waste of money. And I think we're, we're, we need to be above that. I don't think we need to keep shifting players around to try to you know, either tinker with things or, or, or to try to bring something out of one player but not the rest of the players. I think when you do that, things fall apart. Cause that's what we're doing right now with Rams on the right. So you play the players where they're best at, and if if you change anything, it's not where they play, it's how they play, and then you get the best out of them. That's you know. So. Okay, it's five minutes of my life. I'm not getting back. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> I'm joking, Drake. I'm okay. Joking. I'm well, gonna fucking qu- kill you later, by the way. <laughs> whose question is it next? <laughs> it's Drew's question next, isn't it? Fantastic. Okay, right from Sanchez, who is at party. Usha Pandi. That's just making stuff up for the sake to annoy me. That's what that that's, is. No, that's a Welsh town. Is it? Yeah. Okay. Um, do you think we can win the Premier League and or Champions League with Arsene Wenger? I, I don't think so. Um, I think the, the amount that's being spent um, by our rivals domestically, I think that's just going to be the reason. I, I forget who, who brought it up in one of the chats. Um I don't remember if it was, 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 was it, may, it actually may have been Dom. He was saying if, if we go out and spend, you know, seventy million next next summer, for example, then Chelsea and City can go. You know, what what the hell just happened? Well, clearly we need to spend more now, and then they'll spend triple that, and then we're back to square one. Unfortunately, we we just cannot keep up with the spending of our rivals until something changes. I know we are much better at building an actual team than they are. Um, but unfortunately, when you keep buying the best players and when they eventually click, there's no stopping them. That that is that is the, the one fault. Uh, well, not fault, actually. That's the one upside of spending all that money. Eventually, the players are going to click and eventually all their talents are going to come out and eventually they, they, they're still playable. As for Champions League, there's not a shot. I mean, I know we were just talking about expectations of the season and, you know, we need to get out of the round of 16, and I agree. But making a run to the semifinals right now, if you look at it, Three of those four spots are traditionally really reserved for Barca, Real, and Bayern. And if you look at all the other teams that are in the competitions that usually make the runs, are we really the fourth best team in the competition ever? I really don't think so. Making a run in Champions League takes a lot of luck, um, and I understand that. And if a club like Juve can make the finals or if a club like Atletico can make the finals, then maybe there's a chance. But those clubs are also better suited for runs in Champions League. I don't really think we are. And I think you see that when even clubs like Chelsea and City struggle. Um, I think premiership clubs are built to win the Premier League. They're not built to challenge Europe. But if you look at all the best teams on the continent, they're built to do well domestically, but they're also built to challenge in Europe. And I think that's where we always fall short because that's just not that's just not the way the club operates. So no, I don't think we'll have a Champions League. Yeah, thing. Can I just quickly add to that? Yeah, yeah. To be fair, to be fair, like I 100% agree with you. We're we're we're, we're, we're definitely punching above our weight with Bayern, uh, Real, and, and Barca, and probably to an extent PSG. But my thing is on that is that they um oh, I'll put it bluntly, those teams have got it pretty easy in their leagues anyway. You know what I mean? I, I'm not saying that, you know, oh, well, they just advance to the Champions League because they've got it easy. They still have to play 36, 38 games. But in reality, they don't have to focus on the league so hardcore because, you know, they're either going to win it or be second. There's no dropping out of fourth place to Liverpool crap that they have to deal with, you know? Right. True. Okay, All right. Next End question that. Yep. <laughs> is gonna is gonna go to Chimp. This is from Dominic Zaguna, who is at Etienne Domin 
Dominique. Ah, he's, he's Dominique. a good friend of mine. I'm constantly chatting on DM with him. Lovely oh, fella. Lovely, lovely think, fella. I think I can image his face as he got the camera looking above him as he's in the stadium behind him. No. Fair enough. Forget that. Um, so, Chimp, should fans mock and piss take out of fellow Arsenal fans? Question mark. As for me, it's pathetic and nonsense. Oh, uh, God. Um, probably not. But I think that's sort of the level. I mean, I presume that he's talking directly about Twitter more than anything else. I mean, it's just a toxic... Yeah, most people wouldn't have the balls to do it to the face of the people who are having a go. No, of course they wouldn't. I'd like see someone have a go at Raj or call Jeff a twat to their face. <laughs> It's just not going to happen, is it? No. Um, I mean, I think uh, Gim used it on DM to me the other day, the word toxic, um, which is a really good description for Twitter at times. Um, you get some really balmy fans, um, and you just wonder how serious people are, how serious they are being a fan. Um, sometimes I think people just want to come on for an argument, want to have a fight. Um but no, of course you shouldn't. You, you, you all support one side, and it's one thing to taking the piss out of a Chelsea fan or a Spurs fan after results, whatever. But you know, some people almost enjoy when Arsenal fail. It's a, it's, it's a we can get on the let's get Wenger out bandwagon. Um, Piers Morgan's, uh, although I don't like talking about him, I don't even like mentioning him. But he's the typical kind of person where you hear very little for him when things go well, but as soon as things go bad, they can't wait to pipe up. So no, we shouldn't, we, we shouldn't be. We shouldn't, of course, we shouldn't be. But it, but it happens. Hmm, jolly good. Right, next question is this: your turn next, isn't it, Jake? No, has Simon said anything in the last fifteen minutes? <laughs> no, he's been very quiet. Should we give this give Simon, Simon a run. Okay. Um, this is from Carl, who is at that underscore London underscore guy. Why is everybody making excuses when it comes to signings? There's no way there was no one in capital letters available in world football to buy. Uh, buy also, if in May we end up fifth but retain the FA Cup, does that constitute a successful season? That was via two tweets. Uh, well, the transfer thing, you know, we talk about. Obviously, there are players available, but they're not the players that. You know, Wenger wants to, to strengthen the squad. And he said right from the start of the summer, he's only buying players, you know, who are going to challenge and go straight in the first team. And that's that's the way that all big big club operates. Now, you don't see... I know people saying, oh, well, there's obviously we could get a better player than Arteta, than Flamini, like so. But, you know, big top four clubs don't buy backup players, do they? They go and buy, you know, you know people to come straight in the team. And, and like we've spoken about extensively on other pods, and so there wasn't the players either in the the positions that Wenger wanted that he felt were worth the money and and uh, the fee and the, and the wages and, and fair enough if that's if that's his opinion so i think that's that's really it. they answer that and then in terms of finishing fifth in the FA Cup did he say what would that be in, what did he say would that be uh, an overachievement or what no he said uh, with would fifth place in the premier league and retaining the FA Cup would does that com- constitute a successful season uh, it'd be a record breaking season because no one's ever retained it three times yeah I don't know I think it'd football. be difficult to say really. it depends how much you, you value the, the FA Cup I don't think Wenger would be particularly pleased if if that was the case I think he'd much rather not have the FA Cup and, and, and finish fourth so um, personally for me I'd, I wouldn't see it as, as, as a bad season but um, I think that Champions League is always is always the priority over over the FA Cup Okay, well, this question I will ask to all of you, including Gimli, one at a time, pick which one you want, from our very own uh, Goonaholic. Hello, Mr. Goonaholic. Um, Black pudding or hash browns, Mr. Gimli? I'd say again. Black pudding. Oh, no, hash browns. browns Because Uh, they've got hash in them. Hey, your ones have. And they've got little lumps of uh, golden wonderfulness. Tears. Angel's tears. Yes. Jake, which one? Oh, hash browns. I can't eat that black pudding shit, sorry. You're not wrong. Neil? I was waiting for you to be called chimp, sorry. Uh, hash oh, brown. Chimp. <laughs> yeah, it's a hash brown all day long, no question. Drew, do you even know what um, black pudding is? How dare you insult my intelligence? Yes, I do. And hash browns. I thought he was going to uh, say, don't be racist. <laughs> I thought about it when I stopped myself. No, you know. She's, she's a lovely that. woman, but I'd still go for a hash brown. <laughs> <laughs> and Simon? Yeah, oh, oh, hash browns. Yeah, I was just dreaming about them. So sorry. Yeah, yeah, hash browns. Not black. I used it's bad. To, it's horrible. My old man's an animal, and he you see like bread and dripping. And back when I was a kid, I used to love black pudding, and sliced that, up and fried till it was crispy. And, and then one day, someone 
It's lard on toast, doesn't it, Griffin? <laughs> it certainly is. And even the, like, the jelly bit, and then I found out what black pudding was, and I went, nah, I don't really like that. That's not a real sausage, is it? It does contain dead piggy, but not Blood. good stuff. <laughs> That's it indeed, okay. On the upside, though, if you're a fan of your hash browns, yes. uh, from the end of next month, McDonald's is going to be serving breakfast all day, so... Oh, and Tesco's... Well, maybe where you are, mate. <laughs> I read on, on Hot UK Deals that Tesco's are doing an all-you-can-eat breakfast for four ninety five, and you just keep going back and getting as much as you want. That's going to be trouble. Well, I don't much know. Much awesome as you can eat. <laughs> yeah, I don't eat their shitty bacon. Lovely. Um, right, who's... Uh, I think this question should be to Jake, because he's next in line. This is from Rob, with an umlat over the O, at Rob JC. There you go. And that's the kind of Twitter name I like. Short and to the point, and it means we've got plenty of room for other bollocks. Does anyone think... Oh, this is to everybody. Does anyone else think that we are really missing Wilshire at the moment with his trademark driving run through midfield, Mr. Jake? Um... Did you say his name was Rob with an umlaut? Yes. So it's Rob. <laughs> I don't know. Um, <laughs> Adam, you better ask Drew about that. He's the, he's the German. Yeah, it's Rob. Yeah, yeah, I think he's okay, just doing so it because Rube, of Urzel. Um, yeah. <laughs> he's probably named <laughs> Rob and he's a geezer. <laughs> I was just trying to have some fun with it. Um, I think we always miss that. Like when, ja- when Jack's on his game, it's like he puts the... Oh, especially when he's at the Emirates, it seems it, it's like he's put the whole club on his back. If, if you know what I mean, like when he's got the ball and it's, you know, I don't know, maybe nil-nil in the 70th minute and he picks up the ball in the middle of the field and hurdles a couple of tackles and then eventually gets murdered and we get a free kick in the edge of the box that we don't score from. But the point is, I think we miss that all the time. And, you know, you got to wonder where he would be right now if he'd had, you know, 100 consecutive games under his belt instead of missing all the time that he had. So, yeah, I, I definitely think we miss it. I, I hope I would gladly give him my ankles if they, if they were any good to keep him fit for as long as possible. Okie dokie. Right, that's the whole round of that done. So what you do, we've got four more questions. You've all done one each. Drew, you go next. Four questions. What do you want, one, two, three, or four? Because one of them, uh, two of them are stupid. Uh, two. Oh, you've picked a good one. Okay. Devin Dawson, at Devin underscore D underscore 23. With Santi being pushed back, Alexis left and Ramsey right, is it safe to say that Wenger is building a team around Ozil at number 10? I I think it's actually the opposite. Um, the way we're playing right now, to bring the best out of Ozil, you have to use him in a more direct manner. Uh, Hello. And <laughs> it's, it's my my yeah, my friend's daughter. Good evening. Um, is, is Donald up uh, there to say hello to her? He's, hello. Uh, there you guys go. Um, no, I, I yeah, I think um, the, the the way we're playing right now it is actually not bringing the best out of him. He's still fantastic at creating chances. He still controls the play very well, but the types of chances he's creating aren't as penetrative or high quality that you would get as if when you saw him play for Real Madrid and they were direct, they, they went at you at pace, you know, they would carve open opponents in three passes as opposed to needing 45 passes to do it. Um, so I, I think while Ozil's coming more into his own with us now, and as Jake Groton is, is, is a really good blogger, I don't know how to read, read it, um, Ozil's finally really adapted. Oh, thanks, right? Yeah, no, it's fantastic. Ozil's adapted more. He's adapted his game to, to suit our play style. But I, but when you say when you see him play for Germany and when you see him play for Real Madrid and when you saw him play for 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 Werder Bremen and even at Schalke when he was a kid, he just played in a way where he would pick the ball up and people were already making runs and he would just find them, you know, with, with a pinpoint pass 30, 35 yards. Now um, he'll still create chances because he he now creates space for others by moving off the ball and keeping possession. He draws defenders to him and that makes space available for others. Um, but I, I don't think he's as effective as he would be. So no, I don't think he's trying to build around Ozil per se, but I think it's more of that Ozil has finally adapted to us. I don't think our tactics have changed. I think Ozil's just been the one that, that's finally, you know, found his group with us. Okay, right. Uh, Simon, you can pick from questions 1, 3, or 4, and oh. 33% of those are silly. Yes, Kim. Well, yeah, just um, before we move on to the next question with Simon, um, I've got a question for... Donald Duck. Um, it, it's quite simply this. Um, oh, here we go. 
Don't talk about spend. Talk about net spend. Elaborate. Well, um, I don't know much about football, so I can't really tell you very much. But, um, trying to miss shit, I, I just see the stadium, so that's all I have. Well, there you go. Very good. From the duck's mouth, as they say. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you very much. He knows more than uh, than certain people do about net spend. He certainly does, especially uh, <laughs> not those who have single-handedly ruined Tesco. Move on. <laughs> so, Simon, question one, two, no, one, three, or four. Remembering that thirty, sixty-six percent of them are silly. Uh, four. Uh, this is from the Arsenal at the Young Blogger. Will we sign anyone in January? And that's the only other sensible question. So, Jake, chimp, you're fucked. <laughs> Um, I, I, I personally don't know. I'm not not that well connected in terms of that. Um, I think it's the same with every every window. As painful it is for Arsenal fans to hear it, that if if the right player is available for Wenger, then you know he, he will not be opposed to go out and spend. You know, he saw it with with Gabriel and Arshavin. He does buy players in January, um, and it'll also depend on you know situation with injuries and the like. It's, Quite possible, in fact, very likely that we'll have injuries out. You know, by then Welbeck will know more with the situation whether Wenger does need to get a strike because you know something could happen in his setback. Um, I wouldn't rule it out, certainly not sure, because he wanted to buy someone. Well, he wanted to buy two more players in this window. He didn't get either, and I think if he can in January, um, I don't think it'd be against doing it. So yeah, it's it's possible for sure. Oh, okay, right though. Um, so it's Chimp and Jake with the last two questions. Um, who wants Raj's question? If I don't know shout once, I'll take Raj's question. <laughs> this is from the soon-to-be birthday boy, who's he's going to be a very important number on the 18th of September, which is going to be what day of the week is that? Oh, it's only two weeks Friday. Have you, have you arranged the 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 cake and stuff for him, Gim? Uh, yes, it's oh, uh, one of those little Tesco ones with a real yeah. cream in. We've really yes. pushed the boat out. Two pound fifty, I think it was. <laughs> And it says net spend on there. It does. Uh, well, it, we won't talk about spend. We'll talk about net spend. Lovely. And I don't even want to buy any nets. No. Uh, right, Raj's question, Chimp, is, is punctuation important when writing? Exclamation, exclamation, question mark, question mark, comma, 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 dot, dot, at, at, and then apostrophe. <laughs> Bloody hell. Well, I, I think on, on this pod, it's especially important because we're the bloggers. So, yes, yeah. punctuation is extremely important. If we're talking, talking about Twitter, then no, it, it couldn't be less important, could it? Because I've, I've um, read, I mean, I don't read many blogs. When people, um, I see them in my timeline, I always go and give anybody, even if I don't know them, I give them a retweet. And every now and then I'll go and have a look. And some of them are abysmal. It's like they've written by people who, who don't understand how to write at all. So bless them. And uh, yeah, keep trying. But go and read. If, you, if you're new to blogging, go and read other people's blogs and see how they do them and set them out. And uh, yeah, there you go. That's my little tip from you because my blogging experience of uh, one and a half I've ever done. <laughs> Basically, that, that's all I did. I went to a summer training camp with Michael Burke, and that's how I learned how to host. Oh, you bet. Right, this last question is going to go to Jake. This is from oh, 1963 to present, hashtag UTA, and it is at Moltobeni56. There's just too many numbers in there. It says, Are AFC supporters all there? Sorry, Jake. <laughs> Fuck me, the sun's coming up. This is what you bastards do to me. Um, no, not all AFC supporters are all there. Some of the, some of us, myself and Drew included, are insane. Um, no, no, really. Um, you, you get this in all sex, sex of fans. Like Liverpool fans have been 100%. I love to rip on Liverpool. Their fans have been 100% guaranteed, certain, sure as anything that they're going to win the league every season for the last 25 years. So I don't know uh, what I said. I know what the question was, but it's, it just depends on the individual. A lot of Arsenal fans want what the media tells them to want. And then other than that, they either don't have any idea of their own or they're just lunatics in general. There you go. I don't think I answered that at all, but yep. Okay, one I've just come up with. Um, From each one of you lovely bloggers, if someone is an aspiring blogger, because of the great advice I've just given from my zero experience, if you could all give one bit of advice to an aspiring blogger listening to this, what would it be? And we'll start with you, Jake. I'm going to go as you are on my screen. Get decent (laughs) Wi-Fi. For a blog. Yeah, that's good. 
Uh, very good. Um, one piece of advice. I'm very Don't humbled. Don't live in a cage to... on the top of Hare's Rock. Fuck you. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> Go on, I won't interrupt you anymore. So Sorry. far away from Hare's Rock, it's not funny. Um, uh... What was it again? One piece one of, bit advice. of advice. Okay. Yeah. Oh, firstly, let me um, be proper and say I'm very humbled to be giving any advice to anyone on anything. So thanks for that. You have good um, insight and you do know what you're doing. Oh, well, you know, swings and roundabouts. Um, for me, like I, I, I was, I was never intending to be a writer. It wasn't anything I was interested in. Hated that kind of crap at school. But um, you've got to just be yourself. Like, don't try and don't try and be anyone you're not and use the words that come into your head when you write them down. Don't, don't go out of your, is the word lexicon? Yeah. That, yeah. Don't, don't go out of your, your, you know, your natural word ability. Just, um, you know, there's nothing wrong with being creative and all that, but it's, it's your blog's got to reflect who you are and what you're presenting. And that's what I try to do with my blog is it's, you know, uh, if anyone's ever read it, yes, I actually asked that question. If anyone's ever read it, <laughs> um, you'll see sometimes when I'm flying from back from Perth to Brunei or wherever I'm going that I'll, I'll put in little bits like that, that I'm doing something at the airport or have your own feel. I guess that's what I'd say. It's got to be your own personal touch because it is your blog. There's the quickest way I could have answered that. That'd be good. Neil, you're next on my screen. Or uh, chimp. Uh, <laughs> I'm giving that. you a complex, aren't I? Sorry. Uh, no, it's fine. Um, I, I think we were mentioned before, actually, the best way to write is when the, the time is right for you, as in when you've got something on your mind and you want to get it down, that's the best time to, to do it. If you just sit down thinking, right, I've got to write something, that's probably when you're not going to produce you know, a good as blog as you, you probably want to do. So, so do it when it's in your mind and you need to get something out. Ah, short and sweet. Drew, you're next on my screen. What what do you advise them? Um, I think it builds on what Jake was saying. Uh, I think you need to find your voice as a writer. Um, and that, that goes kind of hand-in-hand hand with your own style. Um, I think every every great writer, whether it's been a sports journalist or an, you know, an author or whatever have you, they've had their own little personal like personal touch like a way of like when you read their words you sort of almost read it in a way that they would say it to you um i think that's different with everybody um like i have my own style of writing neil has his jake has his which includes poor grammar (laughs) i'm just kidding (laughs) i appreciate it (laughs) just messing with you dude and then simon has his i think um but the, the thing we all have is we have our own styles, but we're all passionate about it. And if, if you can't find your own voice inside your passion for what you're writing about, then you, you shouldn't bother being a writer. That's not to discourage you, but writing is an art form and art's about passion and art's about self-expression. Um, so, um, I love what, what say what Jake writes, for example, because Jake, you can, when you read Jake's words, you, you can tell that Jake is coming out as very Australian, which isn't a bad thing because that's who Jake is. Um, Neil is very well spoken. Yeah. So listen, whenever you read Neil's words, Neil is very well spoken. So when you, you you feel like you're at a poetry reading when it's Neil's writing, um, <laughs> you know things like that. So you you can correlate the words with the person and their personality. When that comes together, you get a sense of who they are beyond the words. And I think that's what's important when it comes to writing. Okay, lovely. And finally, it's Simon. Just reach climax. Oh. Who's <laughs> <laughs> <It's> Gimli? <laughs> He loves his blogging. Go on, Simon. Any wise words? Yeah, um, I think just just write as you know, like the guy was saying. Just just try and write as much as as you can and things, and don't don't worry about obviously at the start. I think we'll all admit we probably weren't great at it, and you get better just from from writing good bits of work, bad bits of work, just practicing. And and like you say, read as much as you can and read. You know, don't just read. You know, football blogs, blogs on other things. You know. Some of the best blogs aren't, aren't they might enjoy or not on football and stuff, and you'll just pick up different different ways people write and stuff, and yeah, just enjoy it and don't put too much pressure on it at the end of the day, and just have fun with it, really. 
Uh, and finally, Gimli, so you don't feel left out, you're bringing out a range of Arsenal colouring books. Have you any uh, any hints to the listeners on uh, decent ways to do your colouring in? Yeah, always go from side to side. Um, oh. Try not to use crayons because I, I... That's all you're allowed to it, use. No, well, if you... T- from personal experience, I think it's always easier to use felt tips because, I mean, felt tips don't taste very nice. Um, crayons are extremely tasty um, and they do classes at least three of your five a day so I think the best thing to do is if you remember felt tip pens side to side and try not to go over the black lines excellent well and, and also should we shoot more um no no okay right you can take back over now so I, I shall ignore what's going on fantastic uh the only thing that's left is a personal question for me to all of you bloggers um and thank you very much for giving me your time this evening um i'm sure that the people listening to this will have enjoyed it as much as me just sitting back and listening to you guys answer the questions um But my last question for tonight would be, what are you most looking forward to writing about this season for ABW? And we'll start with Drew. When we end up winning a league and it all gets thrown on our face by the end of it. (laughs) I think that's the thing. Well, that that would work for me, definitely. Um, Neil? Um, I I think, I mean, personally, I I love looking at um, the team tactically um, and seeing what 11... You know, becomes the most cohesive unit. So I'm really looking forward to, to seeing how the team progresses and, and what I think that the, how organically this team is going to grow. Um, so for me, it's all, it's all about see how the team grows. And obviously, wouldn't it be wonderful um, just to uh, have to write about a Champions League final or, or a double? Cool. I'm salivating. I'm wetting uh, the appetite there, aren't I? Oh, you certainly are, Neil. Um, Simon. Um, I think probably the the young players coming through again. I think I, I've all, I'm always one who likes it when the fact the club bring through players and and you know the next big thing so to speak and stuff. And last season it was it was Bellerin enjoying watching him and think I think the same same will be this year. Just excitement about you know the players coming through and I already had it with Jeff just a little flash of him and I think um, that'll be enjoying sort of watching and, and writing about those lads progressing. Wonderful and Jake. Please, finish us off. Oh, two times in one night, you lucky buggers. <laughs> um, I'm very much looking forward to Giroud shoving it in everyone's face when he scores 22 goals in the league and 30 in total this season. Wonderful. Well, I mean, I'd love that, but I'm joking, really. Um, I think he's capable of 20 goals in total, but not the league. But um, <sighs> I, I'm looking forward to just seeing how the team goes and the standout performers and that kind of stuff I like to write about. If you look back on last season, I think every second word that came out of my mouth was Sanchez. So, yeah, I'll just be looking forward to seeing the guys perform well and people having less to whinge about, which means less Piers Morgan. Yeah. It's good for all of us. Yes, definitely. A a Piers Morgan free life certainly would be wonderful. (laughs) Um, Before I get some shout-outs and we eventually wrap up the show, um, I just wanted to say that every year um, the podcast gets bigger, we get more and more listeners, um, and that is very much the same case with our blogs as well. Um, You know, we've only had four people at the moment um, that are writing for us, and we'd like to go another step further. Um, So I guess this is a bit of a live advertisement for anyone that uh, writes already and writes at a level and wants to better themselves. Um, We have, at a stretch, two positions available. Um, If there's anyone listening to this uh, that likes the sound of the boys that are writing here, wants to be part of a team and uh, wants to be part of ABW, um, then send us, uh, whether I say applications, because that sounds kind of like arrogant, doesn't it? Because it's, it's not really a job. You do it for the love of it. So if anyone's interested in writing for us, and of course the, there will be people that are disappointed, um, then please send uh, a DM to at the Bergie blogs, um, and we'll try and follow you back or or we will adhere to follow everyone that has something Arsenal in their bio or or drop us a tweet saying, interested in writing, we'll follow you, drop us a DM and we'll go from there. Um, But we are looking for people to be part of our team. So if that interests you, um, 
drop us a line. Right then, shout outs. Uh, I'll go to Simon first. Who's your shout out, mate? Uh, I'm just going to give a shout out to uh, Jeff or the other Jeff, as he's he's probably known on uh, on Twitter. Um, just for he was obviously you know, when we first started doing these blogs, um, someone that brought us all together. You know, great follow for anyone who's an Arsenal fan. He's at I can't even pronounce his last name. It's not even going to try, but it's. H O L L E F R E U N D. Uh, he's a great follow on Twitter and just a nice guy to have a chat with. Give him the toxic nature we talk about on Twitter, someone you can have a genuine conversation with. So give him a follow and uh, enjoy talking about the Arsenal. Yeah, it's a very good follow indeed. Uh, Neil? Um, mine's going to be uh, somebody you've already mentioned, actually, uh, Dave Seeger. Um, obviously, he's a fantastic writer himself. Um, he's at GunnarDave66. Um, Great on Twitter, great to chat to in general, and um, well worth a follow. Yeah, I agree with that. Dave's a good friend of mine as well. And uh, anyone that's not following, I can certainly say they're missing out. Uh, Drew? Um, this might seem a little weird, but I want to give a, a shout-out to you guys. Because um, oh. I'm, I'm the newest one here. Um, but I feel like what we have going on here is... Um, is something special. I think we, we've got uh, and a, a truly Arsenal tradition. We've got a great camaraderie here and we have a really good understanding and we all get along very well. And even when we don't agree with our discussions, we're all very respectful of each other. And it's about the community of being Arsenal supporters. Um, and I think we do that better than anybody else. And I think that's why um, no matter what I'm doing in, in my own personal life, that um, this is always going to be a part of it. So I, I thank you guys for bringing me on. Um, I thank you guys for being fantastic. Um, yeah, so that's my shout out. Oh, well said, Drew. Uh, it's a it's a pleasure to have all of you guys on board. Um, you work so hard for us, and the, just the the level of of blogs you put out is just absolutely amazing. And you know, we've actually been put in. Um, in polls with the top 15 of um, an Xperia poll of blogs you should read. Um, my shout out is going to be for at the Bergie blogs. And that is where you can get all the blogging news. Um, I'd like to, I'd like to think that all of the bloggers on here would be able to have the details um, to our Twitter account. So you can talk to them at any given point um, about anything that might be coming up. So give that a follow. And Jake, Again, for the third time this evening, please finish us off. Oh, I'm so sorry, Neil. He's going to murder me for this. <laughs> um, can I do a shout-out to a... I'm not sure if he's even an Arsenal fan, but I do have a shout-out in mind. Is that all right? Mm, yes. All right. He is a... and I don't know. This is big for me because I'm not one of these YouTube video watcher kind of guys, but I've... Um, come across a very interesting gentleman from the United Kingdom by the name of his Twitter handle is grade A under A and he makes some cracking videos I must say he's um it's not silly stuff he's uh it's well thought about stuff of the world and a little bit of bad language which is obviously to my taste but I I really enjoyed it and he's not um someone of mass Twitter fame or anything so do give that a give that a look if you're interested in in a laugh and a bit of free knowledge, because I don't have an Arsenal-y person to think of right now. I'm very sorry. Out of all of the people on Twitter, that's terrible, Jake. You're letting the side down. Um, <laughs> Danny, I know you've yes. got one, haven't you? I certainly do. Um, we ha- used to have the um, the chief blogger, which was our own OG, and now he's moved on and he's got his own site and he's doing his own thing in a very little way. And that the, the subtitle to his blogging site is just another blog, just another Arsenal blog. So I think that kind of sums up the way that he's uh, he's heading for it. He's not going for world dominance. But then now Kate is in charge, uh, Mrs. Kate Gimley. She's now in charge of the bloggers with the uh, she does the the proofreading. Not that they really need it. But then I taught her once how it's a quite a long process process editing the the blogs and putting editing the site to put the blogs on there i told her it once it took me a quarter of an hour and then she did the second one on her own with no help from me at all and so i think she's going to be referred to as the blogging mistress and so that's at guna girl kate on twitter and that's our very own kate and 
I'm just reading here. I think Jake's got a question for Gimli, if he could. Yeah, so go and give Kate a follow. Now, she's in charge, so everybody has to be nice to her, and she likes cake, chocolates, and biscuits and flowers for her birthday. Yes. Uh, Jake, uh, Drew, you've got a question. Yeah, let Drew go, Drew, first. Oh, it, it's not a question. Uh, <laughs> I just read um, Ars blog news. Just to, to piss us all off before we stop taping, apparently where Hodgson has ha- Hodgson's admitted that Welbeck's out for six months because that's what he was told by the club. Oh, yeah. That's that's Into not that. great. Just yeah, just so, sorry to drop the the old fuck bomb on all of us, but there you go. <laughs> well, we're, we're we're ending the podcast on a miserable note. Um, <laughs> unless unless Jake can save us, I'm gonna try, but I'm not finishing anyone else off. My hands are knackered, mate. <laughs> <laughs> you got um, wrists like Popeye. <laughs> oh, mate, I got carpal t- tunnel syndrome like you wouldn't believe. Let's um, call, let's call Dom. <laughs> don't get, don't get, don't get dumb. <laughs> um, okay, yeah. My question was, I've always wondered this. You're, um, you go by Guna Gimli. Is that because you're a massive Lord of the Rings fan, or are you are uh, actually a? Don't dwarf? say bum bandit. <laughs> no, I was going to say Lord of the Rings fan, or you're a dwarf. Which one is it? Um, or, uh, actually, how did you come about the name? If not, if you're not a dwarf. Um, the, the name came about uh, when we first started this. Uh, many of you won't be familiar when me and Danny first to get, got together podcasting. I didn't even know who it was. No, we uh, we we were under the um, name. Uh, what was it? A Steve Bowles Collective, wasn't it? Yeah. And yeah. Um, many of you, well, some of you will remember that. Um, a lot of you won't. But uh, it was a it was a name given to me by the late great Steve Bold. Um, of a Steve Bowles collective. Um, I don't know how the name actually came up, but I said, you know, I didn't want to go on there with my proper name because I wasn't an aggravational account, but... Uh, I, that I, then transgender isn't as accepted as it is now. No. Um, I mean, look, at, <laughs> is, it, is it Frank Maloney, the boxing guy? Yeah. Yeah. That's right old stanner. Yeah. So... Uh, Suits you, sir. We, we, we thought it was best. I was in transition. Uh <laughs> You're still down to one tip. Yeah, because they didn't donate enough. <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't even know. I listened to that Steve's Wall Collective, and the first thing I said to them is, your fucking audio well, is terrible. Shit. I said, your audio is terrible. He said, do you think you can do better? I said, yeah. And then I listened to this Gimli bloke, and I followed this Gimli bloke on Twitter, and I started talking to him. No, and then you I didn't. Got... We knew each other long no, before on. then. And then, and then I got a, a message off of your other account saying, do you know who that Gimli person is? I said, I've no idea. And he went, it's me, you twat. <laughs> I went off oh, for fuck's sake, you knobber. And then they said, Do you want to come on? I come on and then took over and now look where we are. Yeah. A match made it away. <laughs> <laughs> so there you go. I think it was one of the people they were come trying to come up with a name for you, Steve and um his mate. Ray. Ray. And they were trying they just said there's somebody else in the room and oh he's little in little and small and ginger calling Gimli. Something to do with Lord of the Rings, but I've not seen all the Lord of the Rings either. I don't even like Lord of the Rings. No, nor do I. Oh, you pricks. It's a little bit gay. To be honest with you, I think that people that watch it are... Wonky. Special needs. I've said it. I should not. There you go. No, notice, Jake, it's you that lives in Hobbitland yourself. (laughs) New Zealand it's from, and it lives in Australia. Just across the water. It's all all the same. It's all the same. It's all Antipodean. I've I've been there. It's It's all the same. One's just Jay, you, say that, you say that in full knowledge that the the books and movies were based on old England. So, f- f- yeah, take that you, and shove it. No now it's it comfortable to it, square on your body. Now I shall begin. <laughs> <laughs> All that's left is to thank my wonderful, wonderful panellists tonight, the ABW bloggers, Drew, Neil, Simon and Jake. Thank you so much for joining me tonight. Anytime. Don't all speak at once. It's like <laughs> we're on a yeah, yeah, podcast. Yeah. Like, fuck off, then. Thanks <laughs> for <laughs> having us for sure. But uh, we hope to get another one of these blogging pods out in the next three or four months. Um, so I would guess, I think around Christmas time. We'll try and do one around Christmas time, and or we'll halfway through the season. Uh, yeah, and uh, we'll see how close um, Danny Welbeck is to uh, getting back. So, uh, Donald, if you'd like to see us out with a nanu nanu. Thank you very much. So that was 
a Burkamp Wonderland. Pop. In fact, fuck it. No, let's let's get Donald Duck to do it. To, to say, to sing us out, Drew. Yes. What, what do you want me to say? So that was a Burkamp Wonderland podcast. Thank you so much for listening, and keep it Arsenal. Good night. Wonderful. So I want everybody to count to five in your normal speaking voice. So, um, hold on, if I look at my Skype call, who's first on the left? Jake, you go first. What am I doing? Count to five. (laughs) Two. No, you're not Jake. Shut up. Four. (laughs) Five. Skim, be quiet. That was American. That was American, then. Five. I I was sure after three came 17, but okay. Five. Uh, One, two, three, four, seven. Okay, right. Chimp. One, two, three, four, five. Drew. Five, two, three, four, five. <laughs> <laughs> what the fuck was that? He's got Donald what Trump with him. <laughs> Special. Oh, fuck, that's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Drew, do the whole thing. Yeah, do the whole thing like that. <laughs> Oh, we're actually, uh, we're, we've got a live interview with Donald Duck. <laughs> <laughs> Do the laugh, Drew. Do the laugh. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I've got one plugged the headphones so Kate can listen. Kate, oh. listen to this. Drew, say so. Hi, Jake. How are you? <laughs> Fucking hell, that's so good. <laughs> Hold on, actually, what I'm going to do... Oh. It's, it's freaky coming from someone who's just taller than I am. That's what makes it freaky. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to see that in the street. Yeah, that's, that's the thing that gets people. How tall are you, Drew? Uh, six four. Jesus fucking Christ! Yeah, I'm a solid <laughs> group, so there you go. And faster, so that works out, because I'm black. So. That's only yeah, good for running like away. Jeans. It's all that running yeah. from the cops, man. They can get you into shape. <laughs> you have to teach Gimli that he needs to know how to run away. Kate, Kate had the headset on, he was wait- she was waiting for some uh, Donald Duck. Oh, go on in. Oh, oh, hold on, hold on, hold on. I'll pass it over. Oh, okay, I'm there. Hi, Kate. Oh, that's so good. I know, thank you. <laughs> say something. Say something dirty to Kate. Thank you, asshole. Oh my god. <laughs> oh my eyes are stinging. Yeah, like, like, over here. <laughs> I'm fucking done with that. <laughs> It's better when I'm drunk. <laughs> if we can't work that into the podcast somewhere... Yeah, fine, I'll do it. I can do it on command, so whenever. Amazing. Hello! <laughs> <laughs>